Hello and welcome to this video and in this video I'm going to be looking at the albums of Frank Zappa and also looking at his life and what he did as a musician and a composer, his influence on music. Um, there's a lot of um, documentaries and books out there on, on Frank. Um, it's very easy to find out, you know, his biography. So I thought with this I'm going to take a much more personal journey through his uh, albums, um, really from my point of view. So you, so for those of you who uh, know all the stuff about Frank, it might be a little bit more interesting. I'm a, a drummer, you know, I've played in uh, lots of progressive rock bands. I've also played for Robert Plant and, you know, for a couple of years with him. Uh, lots of different session work, played on the blues scene for a while. So um, you're going to get sort of a, a sort of um, musician's point of view of um, Frank as well. So... Um, where do we start with Frank Zappa? This, of course, is going to be a long video because we have, um, in his lifetime, 62 albums to look at. So Frank was born in 1940 and he died in 1993. And uh, in his time, he produced a lot of albums and those albums are all very, very different. Since he's died, um, they've released another 54 albums. So you're looking at around about 100 albums official albums there also tons and tons of bootlegs you know i've got so many different bootlegs of of him he also produced books he produced films um he was on um, many talk shows you know he was involved in different court cases against censorship you know he was a political figure so he, he he's an absolute sort of titan he's one of the titans that i've talked about in another video um which really dominates um uh, my music world at least. So, um, how did I come to Frank Zappa? Well, I suppose around about 1983, I um, was into sort of a lot of heavy rock bands, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Def Leppard. I'd got into bands like Rush and Deep Purple. I'd even dipped my toe a little bit into progressive rock bands like Yes. And so I'm really searching, looking for music. And um, one night I put on a show that used to be on Radio 1 when I was a kid called The Friday Night Rock Show with Tommy Vance. Uh, and this was a great show for discovering new music. And he played a guitarist called Steve Vai. And uh, he played a track called Call It Sleep off Steve Vai's album, first album called Flexible. Now this album had sort of come out a couple of years before. It was very hard to get hold of, very rare. I think they'd only pressed a thousand copies of it to start off with. But what I heard on that um, that track, Call It Sleep, just absolutely blew me away. I've never, I've never heard a musicianship like it. So um, I started to search for this album by, um, by Steve Vai. And I started to um, search for other things he'd done. And I found out that he, he just joined a band called Alcatraz. I may not even have known that at this time, but I found out that he was with, or he'd been the guitarist with uh, an artist called Frank Zappa. Now I'd heard of Frank Zappa, and I thought Frank Zappa was going to be a sort of weird hippie band, a bit like the Grateful Dead or something like that. It didn't sound like my cup of tea. So, um, but because I'd found out that Steve Vai was the guitarist, you know, I started to search out albums. It took a while to find an album, you know, um, by Fr Frank Zappa with Steve Vai. And it actually, it was a mate of mine who uh, discovered an album called Them Are Us, which we will get into a bit. And it um, had a track called Stevie Spanking on it. Um, and then... The, the morning that he got that album, I remember I had a phone call and my mate sort of, um, you know, he, he rings me up and he goes, um, you've got to come over to my house right now. And I said, why? He said, you've got to hear this album. So, you know, I, I had to walk all the way across to his house. It took me about three hours now to walk over to his house. And I remember sitting down in his uh, living room and on his dad's stereo, he put this album, Memorus, on. And um, I just was absolutely blown away by this. I never, ever heard anything like it. It opened up with a sort of doo-wop track, which I didn't expect at all. And then he went into a sort of comedy track about France and how, you know, he didn't like French and what the French were like. And it, that was very strange and very funny. But within there, there was a lot of sort of weird backwards psychedelic stuff. And then a track called Yehosna came on. And that was like this insane sort of sort of heavy metal, but psychedelic at the same time. There's a really incredible guitar solo from Steve Vai in the middle of that, you know. And as this album progressed, it was such a mixture of stuff I'd never heard before. I think the overriding thing was the immense musicianship, musicianship beyond any 
rock band I was aware of, coupled with humour. Those two things, I'd never seen those two things go together. And then mixtures of very, very intense jazz improvisation, way beyond anything I'd heard in my life. And that coupled with an almost like classical approach to composition. You know, certain bits sounded like, you know, you know modern classical music. And then there was the blues in there, there was doo-wop in there, there was funk bits in there. There was all sorts of madness in there. And a lot of references to things I didn't understand. You know, they were, he was talking about stuff, thinking, what is he on about, you know? So this really intrigued me. And I went out and bought an, another album of his, which happened to be Hot Rats, by, uh, which is a 1970 album. And again, this was so unlike the album that I'd heard. This was a sort of sort of early fusion-y, you know, sort of bluesy experimental album. You know, a lot of soloing on there. There wasn't so much singing on there. It wasn't as funny, you know, but it, um, it had this sort of very overlayered, rich compositional thing. I, I absolutely loved it. And, you know, I, I was sort of wanting to get into jazz. I'd always heard jazz from a young age because my dad was into jazz. So... I remember uh, there was a saxophone solo on side two. When I first put it on, I put the wrong side on, of course, put side two, and then this saxophone solo came on, and it, it sounded like proper jazz saxophone playing, you know, not the sort of thing you'd get like on Baker Street, you know, or something like that, that I was that I'd heard in a rock band setting. It, it felt like proper jazz saxophone playing, and I was impressed by that. So I started to um, get into Frank Zappa and, and research him and to start to buy the albums. Now, I've got here, probably about 60 or 70 Frank Zappa albums. Um, I'm only going to be talking about the um, 62 that were made in his life because I think that's the best way to do this. I think we'll just get so bogged down. And I'm sort of going to go through the albums now, you know, talking a little bit about how I perceived them and, and the impact on me that they had and the impact on other musicians that I was aware of. So. Frank Zappa, yes, he's born in 1940. He sort of grows up in America. I'm not going to get too much into his biography. You know, he comes from um, a household which has moved around. They move out into the desert. The desert seems to really influence him as a, as a kid. He's also influenced by the fact that his dad w works for sort of a chemical research lab or something, you know, and so there, there's all these images in, in sort of Zappa folklore of he's sat at home, you know, with his gas mask on, you know. Um, He's got a thing about gas masks. He's got a thing about a, a, a lot of different things. In fact, he he almost uses cultural artifacts like a painter would go back to a certain subject over and over again. So like, you know, like Claude Monet would paint haystacks over and over again. And Kurt Schwitters would make his paintings out of, you know, cutting up little artifacts from his pockets like tickets, bus tickets, train tickets, bits of string and he'd, he'd make his, album, his, uh, his artwork out of that. And Frank Zappa seemed to be like that. He collected things from all sorts of places but he kept referring back to them. So he's, he, so for example the gas mask um, imagery crops up over and over again. And as when you go through uh, Zappa's catalogue you start to re realise that it's as though it's all one massive piece of art and one track's pointing to one thing and then the other track's pointing to another thing. And some th albums are very specifically about one thing and some albums seem to sit at the top of that and point to everything. This is something that takes a while to really grasp. And this is why Frank's quite hard to go and, you know, buy one album. I am going to suggest one album you buy if you've never bought a Frank Zappa album today. But it's very hard to pick one album that um, does everything that he does. It's very hard. He's doing so many different things. So, yeah, so he's growing up moving around you know he's come from this you know family background where his dad's you know working with chemicals in science you know um he's out in the desert he's he's his um best mate at school or a school friend of his is the um the singer captain beefart who is also going to go on to become one of the great sort of alternative rock weirdo end of, of the world artists you know um in the early 60s he um actually I think he rents a recording studio. So a very young age, uh, sort of 22, 21, 22, he's in a recording studio all day. So he has the unique, you know, skill. He develops the unique skill of um, knowing really how a recording studio works. He's got um, the standard influences of the day. So he's really into doo-wop. He's really into blues guitarists like Johnny Guitar Watson and, and uh, Guitar Slim. You know, he's really into players like that. 
But he also discovers a modern classical composer called Edgar Verres, in particular a track Ionization, which is very percussion heavy, uses a lot of um, polyrhythms and tuplets. And he loves this as well. And so when he comes to creating, you know, rock music, there's these three influences really. There's the doo-wop song influence, you know, very cheesy teenage influence. There's the, the rock guitar, blues guitar, you know, dirty, um, rocky blues influence that Zappa's so good at, and, you know, uh, people forget this. Um, he's into the improvisation of um, those blues guitarists, but paired with, with um, jazz, specifically artists, I think, like Eric Dolphy, you know, more freer jazz, um, more angular jazz, you know, there's that in there. And of course, this modern classical approach to music. Um, so he's in a club one day and he's playing his mad mixture of all this stuff he does and he happens to be doing the blues bit uh, and a guy from Rec Company walks in and sees the blues bit and they're signing blues bands like Mad because of, you know, all the bands that are coming out of the UK, like the Blues Breakers, Brian Auger and, you know, and then in, in, in America, like Mike Bloomfield and all these sort of uh, artists that are emerging. So these, he gets signed and he actually lands quite a good budget for a debut album. And he decides to make a double album. And this is in 1955, 19, um, sorry, 1965, 1966. Um, Bob Dylan's album, Blonde on Blonde's just come out. It's a double album. And he's pushed that format out on that album. I think there's on that album, there's one track that occupies a whole side. It's quite experimental in places. And I think this inspires Frank to push the boat out with his debut album, which is this one here, Freak Out. Now, you know, if you were compiling a list of the 10 important albums in the history of rock and roll, this could well get in there. You know, if you're the sort of person who wants to own all those really important albums, then this is the one to get. You know, this is really ahead of its time. You know, this is an album that's going to influ influence the Beatles to make Sgt. Pepper. You know, it's going to influence the Beach Boys to make Pet Sounds. He pushes everything out to the extreme. Um, it's it's counterculture, and it's counterculture in a way that the hippies weren't. He's not one of the hippies. Um, he's against the hippies. You know, Frank comes in in with a very specific political stance that stays with him for the rest of the time, and it's a very materialist almost like American liberal values of freedom and people, you know, being able to get on with, do their own thing, say their own thing. Um, and that comes in right from the start. And so he doesn't, uh, he doesn't trust the hippies at all. Or they're, you know, talking about peace and love and this sort of utopian idea. He's not coming out of that. If he, he doesn't believe in a utopian sort of vision of the world. And, um, that's on this all the way through. It's critical of the structure. It's critical of the government. You know, there's tracks like um, Hungry Freaks Daddy, um, Who Are the Brain Police, um, things like, um, what is it? The Return of Son of Monster Magnet, which is 12 minutes long. And it's, it's about a sort of almost dystopian view of the world. But it's also, there's tracks like I Ain't Got No Heart and Motherly Love. Wowie Zowie, they're, they're very commercial. Frank, Frank's brilliant at writing a hooky commercial tune. He knows how to do that and he does it all the time, but it's always done with Frank's irony, you know. So they're very catchy. He's one of the great melo melodyists, melodists in, in rock music, jazz music, he, whatever. He's, he's, he's an he's a absolutely incredible composer. Um, and we'll get into that as we get go on through this. But yeah, Freak Out is a very important album. Is it like a classic Zappa album? If you're a Zappologist like me, this is actually one of my favorite albums. I can hear everything in embryo on this. On the next album he does, which is this one, absolutely free. To me, he, he, uh, he, he managed to do it so much better. I think this album's a lot better than Freak Out. So if you're after an early mother's album, this one would be worth getting. A freak Out is worth getting, but this one I'd get over Freak Out. Um, this was the first album to chart. This doesn't get chatted about when people talk about Frank Zappa. Um, freak Out obviously created a stir and was influential, 
But this album actually charted, it went into the American Top 40 album chart. So I think this is where he had his commercial success, enough for the record company to let him carry on doing this mad stuff that he was doing, you know. Um, this has got one of my favourite early tracks on it, uh, Brown Shoes Don't Make It. Look at that, I've got the gatefold here. Kill Ugly Radio, you know, absolutely free, send money. It's... Plastic People, Duke of Prunes, Call It Any Vegetable, The Invocation and Ritual Dance of the Young Pumpkin, which is somewhere between, you know, proto-heavy metal and the Rites of Spring. It's such a bizarre, you know, combination of music. So yeah, this is the, the second album. It doesn't get talked about as much, but I prefer it to Freak Out, really fantastic album. And then he makes the third album of the Early Mothers, and this is sort of the trio of classic Early Mothers albums, which is this one, we're only in it for the money, which is uh, again full of absolutely spot on tunes, really catchy stuff, really experimental stuff, you know, but there's a lot of, you know, stuff that could have charted like pop song stuff if it was just done a little bit more, you know, a bit, a bit less uh, weirder, I suppose, you know, in the, in the lyrical content and the arrangement of the instruments. Um, this, of course, has got the famous, if I bring it up there, the famous Sgt. Pepper parody on the front. Um, around this time, I think it could well have come out before we're only in it for the money, is um, Lumpy Gravy. Now, Lumpy Gravy is, was, was basically a track that occupied side one, and then a track that occupied side two, and it contained a lot more composition from Frank. This is Frank Zappa really staking himself as a composer, as a, a composer within the rock genre. So the first three albums that I mentioned are all under the Mothers of Invention name, that was his band. Uh, Lumpy Gravy is under his own name, Frank Zappa. Lumpy Gravy is, is a really incredible achievement, I think, for the time. I think it came out in, um, it's sort of 1967. It's just so far past anything anyone else is doing in music at that time. It, mix, mix, it mixes orchestral music with like surf, with sort of rock and roll, with music concrete, spoken word, all edited together on tape, you know, with lots of different tape edits. And it's all, it's all held together by these conversations that people are having inside a piano. And he goes back to these people inside a piano over and over again. There's songs about people inside a piano. There's later on, right at the end of his career here, he sticks people back in the piano and records them talking. So, um, Lumpy Gravy, a very important album in Frank's history. Right, so, for me, being the personal, my, you know, my sort of view on this, Ian, um, I was never that interested in the Early Mothers albums. I got them, um, but actually, um, when I first heard them, I didn't like them as much as the sort of later more virtuoso rock and roll albums that I'd heard. Um, by, by the time I got to art college in 1986, 87, I was heavily into Frank Zappa and I mentioned it, mentioned it to my art teacher and he kindly brought this in for me that actually came out at the same time. And this is his album, Mother Mania. And that's, the tracks on here was how originally I knew those first three albums. It was later on I got the actual albums themselves, but this was the album for me. And I think the fact that they programmed like Brown Shoes Don't Make It, Mother People, Duke Approves, Call Any, Any Vegetable, The Idiot Bastard's Son on Side One, and then It Can't Happen Here, You're Probably Wondering Why I'm Here, Who Are the Blame Police, Plastic People, Hungry Freaks, Daddy, America Drinks and Go Home. Those are like um, the real best of these albums. And so this was a real eye-opener. I loved this. When I went actually and got the full albums, it was a bit like, Oh, there's these other tracks on and, and yeah, I don't quite like them as much as the ones on here, you know. So that was my introduction to the Mothers of Invention, the early mothers, you know. At this point, um, Frank's sort of changed his tack a little bit and everything gets a much, much bigger. Um, he starts to delve much more into composition after Lumpy Gravy, but also the jazz improvisation start of things starts to emerge. I think the reason is because he's, he's now on tour and he's gigging. And one of the things that Frank did was he recorded as many gigs as he could. I think towards the end, he recorded every single gig. And um, his band were required to play some very, very complex compositions 
but also to improvise. And we're not talking like jazz improvised jamming. They also had to respond from, to cues and directions from Frank. So on a gig, the tunes are tight. This is some, one of the really hard things to understand about Frank Zappa. The tunes are really tightly composed, but there's space for improvisation. But at any moment in time, that tune can change direction on what is going on in the gig. And he's recording everything that he's, he's doing live. And so the album starts to, you start to get recordings from the live performances start to come through. And uh, the album where this really um, comes to the fore is Uncle Meat. Now, um, I really like the first three albums. You know, I think Absolutely Free, We're Only In It For The Money, um, a, a, a really brilliant, as close to masterpieces as you can get in rock and roll. This is a real masterpiece for me. The musicality just ups. It, this, this 1967, I think this was made, it is just so unbelievably far out. I would argue that this, not Miles Davis, not, um, you know, who else? Gary Burton. Yeah, these guys were all messing with jazz fusion. But this could well be the very first Jazz Fusion album. You know, the thing is it's so unlike Jazz Fusion in the, that's gonna emerge in the 1970s. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture of jazz, classical and rock and roll, but in, on Zappa's own terms. But um, on Uncle, uh, um, sorry, on King Kong, which um, lasts for a whole side on the original, it's basically a sequence of themes and solos, just like you get in Jazz Fusion. He's pushing the recording studio to an absolute limit. I think they're using an eight track at, at this point, uh, which would have been really advanced for the time. And uh, Frank's pushing it to sort of 40 overdubs. And he's also, it's, it's pre-synthesizers, so he's having to really electronically affect, you know, instruments like clarinets and acoustic guitars and flutes. And he's speeding them up and slowing them down and, passing them through guitar rigs and through Leslie speakers and getting all sorts of really strange sounds out. And it really is a precursor to what, say, you know, the Beach Boys did on Pet Sounds. This is an essential Zapper album and it's one of my favourites. Um, <laughs> where that one is so out there musically and so avant-garde, at the same time he then does this, which is the sort of other extreme. He makes a sort of pretend doo-wop album. He invents a band called Reuben and the Jets. And uh, he records a bunch of like two and three minute pop songs, all doo-wop. Um, I've spoken about this in another video, but after Zappa, the themes that are introduced on the first three albums, he like expands on them. And so they become bigger, they become their own little countries in this whole world of Frank Zappa and he often will balance one concept with another concept. Zappa talked about um, composition in terms like of like a cold and mobile which, which is a, a sculpture that hangs from the roof and you have a big blobby bit here and it's balanced by a, a long thin dangly bit there you know and I think that was one of the ways he composed you know there is d different entities and they have different weights and so on the one hand, you have this sort of Uncle Me, you know, sprawling avant-garde, modernist piece. And then at the same time, that's balanced now by Ruben and the Jets, you know, and, and those two things are sort of now playing off each other. You know, it's interesting that these albums come out at the same time. Um, after Uncle Meat, there are two albums that, again, are utterly incredible. There is, well, look at this for a cover. Bert Weenie Sandwich and Weasels Rip My Flesh. Again, these are two of my favorite Zappa albums. Um, this one is, is more the sort of jazz improvisation one, but there's a ton of composition on there. And this one is more the composition, but there's a ton of jazz, jazz improvisation on there, but they're, they're slightly different. They, they seem to have come out of the sessions and the live gigs surrounding Uncle Meat, you know, there's, there, Uncle Meat was made as an album, whereas these are sort of patched together from different sessions and different time periods. You start to see this with Frank more and more as time goes on. The, the way he uses the recording studio, the way he uses recordings live, you'll get albums now that are, are mixtures. In the same track, you might have a studio part, 
a live part, a live which has got overdubs in, another gig somewhere else, and it's all edited, edited together meticulously, and you really start to see this, you know, coming, you know, to the fore. Um, and I think that album cover really sums up his compositional process. You know, with all these elements sort of stitched away together like a collage. You often get collages on on Frank's albums. But yeah, these these two are really great. The 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 original Mothers is sort of disbanding at this point. He's bringing in um, even greater virtuos virtuosos into the band, and he's really working closely with a musician called Ian Underwood, who plays sax and woodwinds and keyboards. He's a real virtuoso, and he's he's able to, you know, um, he's able to put into, you know, take Zappa's compositions further out, you know. Zappa uses his musicians very cleverly, you know, a bit like Duke Ellington in this regard. He creates compositions, but he creates compositions with musicians in mind, um, and, and their input becomes key to the composition, which is completely unlike classical composers, you know. And Ian Underwood's virtuosity, you could tell, you know, Frank's really relying on that now and able to, re, you know, write very complex parts for him, as are the other musicians that are, are in the band, you know. Um, there's a, the, I'm going to show you a non-jazz album. Actually, that Ian Underwood um, connection produces this in around about 1970. Frank Zappa, Hot Rats. Again, this is another... F another deeper foray into jazz fusion i would say this is one of the great jazz fusion albums now um one of the earliest ones you know came out the same year as jack johnson um and um emergency by tony williams um this is another one of the great classic albums um it charted in the uk so us british people really tend to love this album it's not rated as highly outside the uk but i do really love this album and like i say it was the second album i got and if you are a big Hot Rats fan, I suggest you get this. John LaPonte plays the music of Frank Zappa, King Kong. This is um, basically, um, it's a Frank Zappa album. It's composed, arranged and produced by Frank. It features the same musicians that are on um, Hot Rats. So if you do love Hot Rats, and there's many out there that do, that is an incredible album. It's also one of John LaPonte's great albums, and it's completely unlike the Fusion albums, which I do love, by the way, but it's completely unlike the Fusion albums he makes in the later 70s. Um, absolutely incredible, you know. Um, it's got George Duke on there. You can see the next band starting to emerge. Now, the next period after this, the Mothers changes again, and he brings in two singers called Flo and Eddie, and Howard Cale and Mark Volman. You know, and the band's now got Ainsley Dubar on drums. So I think it's got George Duke in on trombone to start off with, and then keyboards. Um, this lineup produces a number of albums which I haven't got because I was never a fan of this lineup. This is my least favourite lineup of, of Frank Zappa. There's people who love that band out there, and you must check them out. You know, they did an album called Chunga's Revenge, which is my favourite of those albums, and then they did Live at the Fillmore just another band from LA um, and I feel like there's another one there but these albums I, w I was never that keen on um, I think Frank's sort of scatologically of offensive lyrics really come to the fore there's a lot of songs about groupies you know a lot of scatological songs and I think this is where he got a reputation for for, for that which I think diminished him a little bit um, the band is a virtuoso band, but it's he's, he's, it's much more like a normal rock and roll band. It's not so um, counterculture as the original Mothers of Invention. Um, two of the bands, uh, just another band from LA and Fillmore East, their live albums. Um, he brings in, I think, is it on Fillmore East? He's got Billy the Mountain which is one of his first epics, you know, conceptual epics, which sort of comedies. The comedy comes a lot more to the fore. With the early Zapper albums, the comedy is sneering. He's, he's poking fun at society. It's not actually that funny. But here you sort of really start to get almost like full-on comedy songs. I think the albums did well, which um, meant he did more of that. But I think in around about 1972, when he was on tour with that band, um, he was doing a gig at the Royal Albert Hall and um, some guy got on stage and pushed him off and he broke his, I think his pelvis and he ended up in a wheelchair for a year, 
which takes him away from that band in a way. He's, he has to compose his way out there. So he starts to compose for large group. And you get two albums that are absolute classics. The first is this, Waka Jawaka. And the one after that is the Grand Wazoo. And these, um, these are, 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 are very tight compositions with space for jazz improvisation um, for a very large band. So um, I think almost like an orchestra. Um, oh yes, before this he's also made a film called 200 Motels and that's the other album. And that's, that is a real high point. Um, I really do like 200 Motels. And again, that's the first time you see, well it's not the first time because Frank worked with an orchestra before he got signed, he made um, music for f a couple of films. But on 200 Motels, he's working with an orchestra as well. And you, you, you hear him, you know, emerging as a serious orchestral composer. These are really interesting because they're not, they're not, it's not an orchestra. It's like a big band. He's writing for big band. These are like his big band albums. Um, and they're both absolutely incredible. Um, on here, Big Swifty that lasts the whole side. I just love that, especially the theme of Big Swifty. I think it's one of his great tunes. But this one is just absolute masterpiece. Um... There's a track called Eat That Question that just starts off with an improvised piano solo by George Duke and it's just rambling. It's, you'd never get this in a, in a classical concert. He's, it's just mad rambling, jazz piano. He's playing a lot of two-handed stuff and it slowly turns into this like sort of R&B groove and that starts to move and then the whole band kicks in and then suddenly it just opens up into almost like a, a sort of, you're in, it, 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 all this brass comes in and it suddenly sounds like you're in a sort of Roman amphitheater. The gladiators are going kind to of come out, and it's it's it it could be like like Carl Orff or something like that. Really incredible switch around. So yeah, these two albums are absolutely fantastic. Um, once he gets his um, legs working and he gets out the wheelchair, he reforms the mothers again, um, and uh, he makes one of the most successful versions of the Mothers, which is what I call the Funky Mothers, which has got like Chester Thompson on drums and Ralph Humphrey, it's got George Duke on keyboards, um, Napoleon Murphy Brock on saxophone and vocals, very, very um, rhythm and blues based vocal. It's got Ruth Underwood on percussion, who's absolutely fantastic. It's got a whole level of virtuosity. It's got a whole level of sort of jazz fusion chops and it's very funky as well. Now, you, you may, no, I'm a huge Mavishnu orchestra fan. Zappa did a tour with the uh, Mavishnu. Uh, and I heard a story, I think, told by um, Ruth Underwood where, you know, he came out and did his thing. He was very impressive, very virtuoso. And then the Mavishnu orchestra came out and they did their thing. And it, it, um, it, it sort of... It's all right, my kids are trying to get in. <laughs> See what I'm up to, stuck in here talking about Frank Zappa. Um, and when he saw the Mavish Doctor, what they're doing, he could he saw that this was on a different level to any other band around. I think this map, the Mavish Doctor, had an effect on uh, many musicians at this time like this. And he, he actually actively went out and found Chester Thompson, which, who was a very Billy Cobb esque drummer. And he switches the band; it becomes more earthy, becomes a lot more funkier, a lot more um, a lot more fusion chops there as well. It's a really incredible band. The the um, what I call the George Duke band. And he makes um, some really incredible albums, which are among my favourite Zappa albums, and I think a lot of people watching this will be their favourites too. Overnight Sensation, which has got like um, Don't Eat the Yellow Snow and Cosmic Debris on. He, he, no, that's, uh, that's apostrophe, sorry. You've got Overnight Sensation, he's like, uh, I'm the slime, dirty love, zombie wolf. Uh, the reason why I say this is because I've got the CD with both albums on you know, over, Apostrophe and Overnight Cessation. I've always seen those albums together. Really fantastic albums, but it's only the beginning. You know, they then take it out on tour and they produce this absolute beast. One of the great classic Zapper albums, you know, the Roxy and Elsewhere. It, it's pretty much live. I think there's a little bit of overdubbing on this. It was originally recorded for a, a, a film which was released in 2015. Um, this is even better, I think, than Overnight Sensation, Overnight Sensation and Apostrophe. Absolutely incredible. You know, one of the great Zapper albums in there. And then he tops that with this 
One Size Fits All. Now, you know I said there's an album that if you've never bought a Zappa album and you want to buy a Zappa album, you don't know where to start. Um, go with this. Of course, Frank knows you should go there. That's why he's called it One, One Size Fits All. And on there is a, is a star chart. And the star chart points to all these sort of little themes and symbols that have, that have been throughout his career. This is the album, I think, that sort of sits on top of all the albums and ties them together. You know, and he, he seems to do absolutely everything. You know, there's like little bits of classical composition, there's little bits of blues, there's, you know, comedy songs, there's serious songs. And there's a, there's a, a couple of quite met, metaphysical songs. It finishes with a, um, a tune called Sofa, which in, in sort of Zappa's sort of um, metaphorical world, this really relates to the whole universe. It's the whole cosmos. There we have a floater, uh, a floater. There we have a, a sofa floating in space. You can see God's hand with his cigar. The cigar, you know, um, refers to have a cigar, which is um, off the first album or second album. So, um, yeah, this is the place to start with Frank, I think. And it's one of his great albums. It's, I think it's my favourite Frank Zappa album. Absolutely brilliant. Um, after that, he, he teams up with Captain Beefheart and he makes an album called Bongo Fury, which is a great album. The lineup's changed a little bit. Um, I, I always felt it was a slightly unsteady, after the genius of these albums, it was slightly unsteady. And, and having Beefheart in the mix as well, didn't quite work. I don't think Beefheart was able to quite deal with Frank Zappa's world. Didn't want to be a part of it completely. Um, it's a it's a really good album. It's got some of my uh, Deborah Cadabra's brilliant, you know. Um, but it, he follows that up with this album, Frank Zappa's Zoo Laws, which is a good album, good solid album. You see the sort of later seventies band emerging here. You know, this is like with the Terry Bozio, Patrick O'Hearn. You know, um, Terry Bozio happens to be one of my favourite drummers. And um, this is uh, this period for me is very special because of, of Terry being in the band, you know. But I think overall, for most listeners, it's not quite um, on the same level as the sort of the Roxy band, the George Duke band. But this is really great. Some really funny stuff on here. Some great guitar solos. Frank Zappa's guitar playing is developing all the way through this. He's always been a really, uh, really interesting guitarist with his own approach, his own way of soloing. Um, but that's developing. The guitar solo is becoming more involved. You know, he's definitely moving towards something. I've always said that um, there's there's very few guitarists where I could listen to a, an, an eight-minute guitar solo, but I can always listen to an eight-minute guitar solo by Frank Zappa. I think because he's such a brilliant composer and he treats the guitar solos as a sort of composition. He used to call it instant composition. So he's very compositional in the way he approaches the guitar. Which is, which is, so he's one of the great guitarists that's able to, to sustain a solo from here and all the way down to there. So yeah, this is, this is sort of a change around album. The band expands again. He brings in a brass section with Michael Brecker and Randy Brecker on. And he then makes this album, Zapper in New York, another live album. Again, absolutely one of my favorite albums. It's got some incredible tracks on. It's most famous because it's got um, the tracks Punky's Whips in which uh, the record company got really worried because of the, the lyrical content of that and they pulled it off the shelf. You know, this is one of the ones that does have Punky's Whips on. There you can see. Um, it sort of goes, one side of sort of comedy, scatological, and then it's got sort of muso, and then another one like that, and then muso. Um, and it includes, this is the one where they debut the Black Page, which is supposedly the hardest track in rock and roll, which it, it's it's not even... It might not even be the hardest track on this <laughs> album, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's a, a very important track to musicians, you know. It changed my life when I heard the Black Page, it really did. So, yeah, this is a fantastic album. This band is now getting stronger, you know, from the Bongo Fury Zuta Lords, which is a bit unsteady. This is getting stronger and stronger. And he releases three albums which sort of do three different things, and they're three of my favourite Zappa albums. The first is Orchestral Favourites. This is another serious composition album with a full orchestra, but with a rhythm section as well. Zappa seems to have some real control over this, and I think it's one of his great orchestral albums. Um, and it sounds a little bit more like a rock band than the 80s orchestral albums do. 
So you've got this balance of this um, orchestra one, and then you've got um, Sleep Dirt, which is like, almost like um, a follow-up to Hot Rats. It's a real jazzy, fusion-y album. And these sort of balance each other, and then right in the middle, you have this one, Studio Tan, which is somewhere between the two. And it, and it contains a track called um, Gregory Peckery, which is a side long. And I think if you really want the most extreme, out there, compositional side of Frank, Gregory Peckery is well worth going for. It's a follow up to Billy the Mountain, you know, so it's got this conceptual continuity going through. And it's about um, a little pig that sort of gets fed up with the rat race and goes out and uh, meets Billy the Mountain and he meets a philosopher and he uh, affects time and um, all the hippies start to age. And that's about as close as I can go to explaining <laughs> what that track's about. But compositionally, it's just absolutely jaw-dropping, yeah. These three albums, plus the tracks on Zapper in New York, were originally going to be released on a six-album box set called Leather. It looks like lather, but it's pronounced leather. And they released that. So now you can go and buy, if you want to hear this sort of later 70s band in all its glory, go and buy leather. This is just absolutely brilliant and it's all there, you know. Um, towards the end of the 70s, he then makes this, one of his most commercial albums, Shake Your Booty. I think this is the third album I ever bought by Frank Zappa. Um, absolutely incredible album. Uh, a double album, loads of funny stuff on. He's sort of settled into a pattern now with these next few albums. Funny stuff, a bit of doo-wop, some great guitar solos, a bit of jazz fusion, some little classical elements here and there in terms of the composition. Incredibly recorded, incredible arrangement, incredible virtuosity. And this is absolute, um, you know, stonker. It also charted, uh, in, you know, made the album charts, as did, I think, Overnight Sensation did. This, I think, um, absolutely free. So this is something that doesn't get mentioned. He is... You know, selling records, I think this sold over a million copies when it came out. Um, and it's got a lot of famous tunes like, you know, um, Bobby Brown and things like that on that, that uh, have sealed it. But it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic album. And it's not just sort of funny commercial songs. The Last Side, which is a whole side long, which has got, got, you know, Wild Thing. And he's, he's, a, he's a absolutely, utterly incredible. Amazing guitar solos on there. As I said, his guitar soloing is developing at this point. Terry Bozio is just... Absolutely brilliant drumming on this. Really, really brilliant. Um, they make another film called Baby Snakes. And there is a live album. And this really is one of his great live albums. People forget this. But if you really want to hear that band in, in its in full power, you know, the Terry Bozio band, check out this absolutely brilliant. Some amazing versions of all the tracks on this late 70s period. Um, another album that's worth mentioning in this, for this period, another violinist. There's two violin albums where I've sort of put them in, even though they're not Zapper albums. And that's Shanker, El Shanker, who was a good violinist with John McGoughlin. Um, Touch Me There. That is produced by Frank Zappa, a lot of the compositions on here are by Frank Zappa. It's a, it's a Frank Zappa album, really. Uh, incredible Simon Phillips on drums on this, and he plays brilliant. And this is an absolutely wonderful album. It gets forgotten in the catalogue, but if you're a Zappa fan and you like this sort of late 70s period, you want to hear something completely different with different musicians, go and check this out. And it's quite interesting to me that, um, uh, you know, when I, I just did a video where I discussed the four titans of music, Frank Zappa, John McGoughlin, Miles Davis, and John Coltrane. And this is the link between Zappa and McGoughlin. There's this link there, which is is the violinists, it's John Ponty and El Shanker. You know, and it shows that Zappa had got an ear to what John McGoughlin was doing at that time, which we could go into further. Um, the lineup changes at this point a little bit, and um, Terry leaves, Terry Bozo, Terry Bozo leaves, and I really think Terry Bozo's virtuosity in drums was able to push the band up, because drummers are very important, you know, um, for Frank, uh, and you hear all these incredible stories about how he would audition drummers, he'd have a hundred drummers there and they'd have to do, you know, these incredible, jump through these incredible hoops to get through the band. And I think Terry Bozio's sort of, almost like classical virtuosity enabled 
um, Frank to push the conversations up. So when Terry leaves, he then gets replaced with one of the greatest drummers on earth, Finney Colliuta. And there's a couple of albums here which, unrelated to Frank, are, are very important to me as a drummer. And the first is this one, Joe's Garage. This actually originally came out as two albums. I've got the box set here, it's almost falling apart, you see, because I've played it so much. Um, the first album charted, and it's very commercial, funny zapper, tells a funny story. It's got some little bits of muso bits here and there. But the um, Acts 2 and 3, which came out as a double album, Vinnie just goes off, off, off the chart on there, <laughs> probably literally. <laughs> Is really incredible, and you know tracks like "Keep It Greasy." I, I can remember when I bought this and put it on, and when "Keep It Greasy" came on, I could just remember my jaw hitting the floor of what was going on. You know, he was he was playing in 1916 and 2116, and Zappa's guitar solo was just all over the place, and 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 Vinny was able to sort of play in that time signature and yet react to what Frank was doing. The guitar playing at this point had become very important. There's some really long extended guitar solos, and some of the guitar solos on here. Uh, he's an acronist guitar solo so what he was doing was he would he would go out and record himself live and then when he did a great guitar solo he would he would just strip that off so he's just that got the guitar solo on its own and then in the studio when the band came to the guitar solo bit rather than play guitar solo he would just hit play on that track and they would have to respond to what the guitar was doing in context of what the tune was doing really incredible uh, approach you know um, and that it, it's sort of for me creates a way of improvising which is up there with what Miles did modally and Time No Changes. It's, it's up there with what Coltrane did, with up there with what Ornette Coleman did. It, it's another way, he develops another way of improvising which is more of a rock band type of improvisation and where the dissonance, rather than coming from the harmony or, or say with Coltrane with the intensity, you know, um, or the way you subvert harmony to create dissonance, which is what a lot of musicians were doing at that time. The the dissonance is created rhythmically. So it's the rub of being in say 13, but you're playing in 17 in the same space. Um, that rub creates a sort of rhythmical dis dissonance. And it got me very interested in the harmonic nature of rhythm. It started to, I started to realize that there was a relationship between harmony and rhythm. You know, a direct relationship, you know, that uh, when you play a fifth, that fifth is actually two notes that are beating and they're beating, they're beating polyrhythmically. Um, and so you can create tension rhythmically as well as harmonically using um, tuplets. Now, before that, drummers would often use the fact that they became more intense, they did fills, you know, or they may bend the time and push the timers around. And, and people like Tony Williams and Elvin Jones had already pioneered this sort of polyrhythmical approach to playing. But Vinny and in the Zappa band pushes this to a, a, a complete extreme, especially on this utter masterpiece. Shut up and play your guitar. Uh, this is a, was originally um, three discs, six sides of just guitar solos. Um, if you're into Zappa, even I didn't want to buy this album. I thought, do I really want like six sides of guitar solos? These are compositions. And every single track on here is a different world created by Frank. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, another way of creating music. This is really one, for jazz, I would say this is one of the most important albums. And everybody improvising afterwards in the fusion world and even in the jazz world, they know what happened on here. And they know they know the things that they're using from this album, but it just doesn't seem to get you know the just deserves it doesn't you know it doesn't get the accolades for me. I think it should be there with a Love Supreme and Kind of Blue. It's it's one of the great jazz albums of all time. It's as sophisticated as any jazz album, and what Frank does with the guitar and how the band reacts to it, especially Vinny. Um, is is just so innovative so that i would say is one of the really important albums he's now got a new band um and um another really important musician emerges at this time because shut up and play guitar is compositional in nature the guitar says so composition compositional frank wanted those transcribed so he comes across a very young guitarist that's 18 years old 
who's a, a virtuoso guitarist but can transcribe anything. And he hires him and he transcribes the solos on Shut Up and Play Guitar. And there's a book of that, which I've got somewhere. And that guitarist was Steve Vai. And Steve Vai's virtuosity um, enables Frank yet again to up the compositional, you know, um, density. And this new band emerges and they, they do a series of albums, uh, which I'm just going to run through now. Right, and this is the early 80s albums. Um, the first one is Tinseltown Rebellion, right, which I think is the sort of first appearance of Steve Vai. And these all, all are sort of new sound. Uh, Zappa, I often talk about these artists that they didn't deal with the 80s very well, and our artists that dealt with the album, the 80s, very well. You know, um, so a band like ELP, I didn't feel like they dealt with the 80s well at all. You know, even before the 80s, they were done. They just couldn't deal with the world, the way the world has changed. Sapper deals with it absolutely unbelievably. So there's no cut off in, 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 in the 80s albums for me. You know, so these are some of my very favourite. And I think this run of albums that you get in the early 80s. And it, it's, it's standard Zapper sort of... Um, blueprint you know there's some commercial stuff there in terms of his own sort of comedy music there's some incredible you know compositions his compositions are getting even more mathematically dense you know he's still pulling for modern culture that's becoming more political there's much more improvisation he really now understands the balance of these elements and how to how to do them so yeah you get you get tinseltown rebellion and that's followed up by um you are what you is, brilliant album. One of his most sort of commercial albums. This is if if you want to play a zap album to somebody that you think is not going to get, it's probably this one. Except it is quite offensive, as is many of his albums. Um, ship, you know, ship arriving too late, to save a drowning. Which this here is is one of my really, you know, absolute favourite zap albums. Um, it starts off with No Not Now, which is this sort of Zappa's own heavy metal. He's got this, his own way of doing heavy metal, which is really gutsy riffs. He's written some brilliant riffs, but it's his, his own snarling way of doing heavy metal. And then you get Valley Girl, which is his, his hit record that he made with his daughter, which I'm sure you know about. And then there's a track called I Come From Nowhere, which is just very, very strange, shrieky rock music with an absolutely incredible guitar solo. And then you put it onto um, side two, and here we have another full side. It's actually three tracks, but they feel like one great big composition. And it's just unbelievable. It's a mixture of live and studio. It's a mixture of solo, very tight compositions. There's a tr track called Envelopes, which is a, almost like um, uh, a classical composition. And then it ends up with a track called Teenage Prostitute, which is somewhere between, you know, I don't know, ACDC and full-on opera and sort of tells a story of a teenage prostitute in a sort of operatic setting you know with a real opera singer it's absolutely strange brilliant mind-blowing if you like that sort of thing um yeah that's a really great album that's followed up by this one man from utopia again absolutely brilliant it's got a couple of compositions on here tink walks and mark magio and magio is just one of his sort of densest compositions you've got some really funny stuff on here uh, you know, some very entertaining sort of pastiches of sort of science fiction on this one. He also brings in this this new thing where he gets he gets Steve Vai to transcribe him talking. This has now been done to death on the internet, but this is the first time you really hear um, you know these impossible things that he's asking Steve Vai to play at that time. Uh, that's followed up with this one. Frank Zappa meets the mothers of prevention. There was two versions of this. A European version and an American version, of course, have the European version. The, at this time, he got involved with censorship battles. And um, the, on, on the American version, I think on side um, two, there's a track called Porn Wars, which is a lot of electronic music with discussions from the hearings and court cases that he got involved with trying to fight this censorship that was going on in the 80s in the entertainment industry. Um, I'm glad I got the European version actually um, because on the European version you get f um, five 
um, synclavier compositions. And this really points to what he's about to do next. But on side one, we've got, we're turning again, Aileen Arfitz, Yokats, and what's new in Baltimore. And they all do really interesting things on this. Um, Aileen Arfitz, again, is one of his great compositions. Uh, what's new in Baltimore is one of his guitar solo tracks. Um, Yo Cats is a sort of comedy tune about session musicians, which I do find very funny. Uh, and We're Turning Again is, is really goes back to sort of, he, he's, he was often discussing the fact that the hippies in the 60s were now running the world and it's in it, and whether that was a good thing or not. But yeah, but you then get these, these sing clavier compositions, right? And that is where in the mid 80s he starts to change again because he's bought a sing clavier. He's now able to write whatever he wants in the privacy of his own studio. He hasn't got to rely on his musicians. He can push it out as far as he can. And that really gets taken to um, another level with the next album, which is called Jazz From Hell. This one here. Um, when this album came out, I didn't know about the Synclavia stuff. I got this one before I got the Mothers of Prevention. Okay, um, so I saw this appeared in the charts. Great photo of Frank. The Jazz from Hell was a brilliant title. I rushed home, put it on, and back in the eighties, because on the back, if you can see, it's got like a list of musicians there: Frank Zappa, Steve. So I thought they were playing this, and I just couldn't understand what the hell was going on because it's, it's all computer-generated music, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, the reason why they've got those musicians on this because there's one instrumental track which is a sort of guitar solo called Sinteti and it happens to be one of his greatest guitar solos of all time, it's absolutely incredible, you know. But as time has gone on I really realised how far he, ahead he was. Here he had, he had made an album entirely created on computers and it seemed really odd, why would we want to do that, why? Because that's the future. He, um, he makes another album at this time, very, very strange album called um, um, Francesco Zappa which is seemed like he'd invented this sort of renaissance composer and it was a bunch of sort of renaissance compositions that sounded like they were done in you know the 1600s uh, but done on synclavier with lo like not the normal instruments you'd expect and then you find out that there actually is a composer called Francesco Zappa and it is his actual compositions it's, an, it's this thing when you delve into Frank Zappa's strange world and you actually sit there and go, well, is this real or not? You know, it's absolutely bizarre. And another strange album that comes out at that time is Thing Fish, which is, 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 is a, like a musical. It's, it's like um, a musical theatre piece, it, it's, uh, a, which sort of spooces a musical theatre. Again, not one of my favourite Zapper albums. Um, not much musically going on here. A lot more about the lyrics and this sort of libretto. Um, very strange album. He releases as well at this time another guitar album which is absolutely fantastic, it's great. Um, it's not quite the same level as Shut Up and Play Guitar but it's still pretty amazing. Uh, nonetheless, you know, it's got some incredible stuff on there, beautifully recorded. His, his live recordings are so, you know, so well done. You know, if you watch my videos you'll so often, live albums, um, I'm a bit down on because I'm always let down a little bit by the, the recording quality. But in Zappa's case, they just sound like studio albums. Absolutely incredible. And so incredible that he, he brings out, at this time, um, a series of live double disc albums called You Can't Do That Stage Anymore. I've got six. I've got three. I've got five, um, six, five, three, and two. And I've also got the sampler that came out at the same time. I didn't quite get them all. I'm not that hardcore a Zappa fan, but I did get as many as I could possibly get my hands on. They're, these are absolutely brilliant, and there's so many treats for a Zappa fan. You don't go to these straight away, but if you do want to just check one out, you know, of one of these, you know, we think, well, what, one of these, I would get, um, Volume 2, which is a live gig by the George Duke Roxy Band, and they're just on fire on that. And it's a whole concert, 
and it, you know, whereas a lot of his albums are edited together when they're live and you can get lots of different takes. It doesn't quite feel like listening to a live gig. This is like listening to a live gig from beginning to end with all the talking left in. Absolutely amazing. So, um, in the 80s, he, he does sort of three major tours. One in 1982 with the, uh, the Steve Vai band. Um, one in 1984 with a cut down band without Steve Vai in. Um, there's a live album called Does Human Belong in Music and a video that comes from that period. Um, that band was a little bit cut down. It wasn't quite able to do the sort of virtuoso stuff. And then in 1988, he then goes out on tour with a big expanded band, full brass section. And I saw him on that tour in Birmingham in April 1988. All right. Um, and so that was the one time I, I got to see Frank. This is when I was a, a real huge fan. I was, uh, I was 20 at that time. And um, that tour produce, produces um, this album here, Broadway the Hard Way. I really look forward to this coming out, um, but actually on that tour he'd written a series of political tunes um, about American politics and that's what you hear. This album's all those, those, those um, tunes. If you bought the CD it was a little bit more expanded, but I got the album. I was a little bit let down by that. As time's gone on, and my knowledge of American politics has got better. I can I can see what he was doing with this at the time, you know. Um, but it's followed up by these two albums, which are absolutely incredible. And again, you get this balance that we we mentioned earlier on. So there's one called the best band you never heard in your life. The reason why is because there was a dispute with the musicians, and some of the gigs got cancelled. So a whole bunch of people never got to hear this band. And this one make a make a jazz noise here. This these two explore this this one here explores the composition a lot more. His compositions are really pushed to the fore. This one is the jazz improvisation gets pushed to the fore. And then you've got this. You can see the thing about this balance thing you get with Frank. Then you get that one as well. And that really does tell you the whole picture about that late period as Zappa Band. And that would be the last full tour that he would do. Um, I was like, at this point, the biggest Zappa fan in the world. I was, I was um, 20, it was my 21st birthday and, and I wrote to him and said, it's going to be my birthday, Frank. I got the, uh, the address for um, Barking Pumpkin, which is label. And I wrote to him saying, you know, it's going to be my birthday um, and I really love you and all that sort of stuff. And bizarre, I can't believe this. He then wrote back. Right, he sent me a couple of little badges that he'd written Frank Zappa on and he sent me this to Andrew Frank Zappa 1989 for my 21st birthday. Um, when I was about to do this video and I was pulling all the albums out and I thought, well, I'll pull that, I'll pull this out. Because I've got my box here actually. He actually, if, if, about three weeks later, I, I, I don't know whether I should have written back and thanked him, but he sent me another one. So I've actually got two. Okay, when I um, came to make this video, I, um, you know, pulling this out now, over 30 years later, and actually holding it in my hand, and thinking that Frank Zappa actually thought about me, and wrote my name, and at some point in history, he's, his pen was writing his name on that. You know, he probably did a whole ton of these that day. But that really does make my hair stand on end. You don't want, and you don't want to see my hair standing up. I think it actually is a little bit. Um, so yeah, that that's this is something about Frank Zappa. I think he, his his approach to music was very down to earth. He was really interested in normal people. It's not spiritual music. He's a materialist. He's a modernist. He believes that people. He believes in the individual. He's like a liberal enlightenment type of guy that believes that people should have freedom of speech, allowed to do what they want, be able to express themselves, you know, like they want to, as long as they don't, un up, you know, upset anybody else. And that voice there, he, he was he, he was so good at deflating, you know, any sort of pomposity or pretentiousness. I think in today's sort of politically correct climate now, he would have had an absolute field day or he just wouldn't be making any music anymore one of the two you know because he was fearless and he would call stuff out you know he really believed that you could say what you want do what you want as long as you wasn't upsetting anybody else and getting in anyone else's face you know let people do what they want and say what they want express themselves how they want you know um 
towards the end of his life, you know, this is the thing he did with Tour 98, he had other projects on the go. And then, you know, we heard on the grapevine that he'd, he'd got prostate cancer and, it, it, and he wasn't looking good. Um, and he finishes off with two albums, which I'd like to talk about. One is this one, The Yellow Shark. Oh, and uh, I don't know where it's gone. I did, I did mention this. In the 80s as well, um, around about sort of uh, 1986, just before that tour, he, he worked with an orchestra a few times, so he made this, the London Symphony Orchestra, um, Volumes 1 and 2. He also did an album with Pierre Boulenx called The Perfect Stranger. And they're great albums. I, I really do like them. I do prefer orchestral favourites more. Um, if you want to check out his classical composition, there's a compilation album called Strictly Genteel. I'll check that out. But he finishes off um, with two things. And I think, where are we? I think I've, I've not yet two albums at the end of his career. This is the last album made while he was alive. It's The Yellow Shark. And he, he finally found a, a classical ensemble that could actually play his stuff properly. Um, with the, with the, t the willing enough to, to rehearse the stuff and willing to actually get into his world and do all the badness that was required for his compositions to work. And he really loved this ensemble, the ensemble modern. And this is again is is this is much better than the uh, the London Symphony Orchestra albums I think if you want to hear him compositionally this is a really great album and it's really funny and it's got loads of amazing stuff on this this is recorded live by Frank it was one of the last thing he did and then in his final years and I do have the album but it's actually not here I've lent it out um, so I must get it back he released a double album a little bit like Jazz from Hell called Civilization Phase Three. Yeah, which was a lot of um, computer-based compositions. So, um, yeah, this has been a long, long talk on Frank Zappa. Uh, I've only just scratched the surface of this guy. Um, why is he so important for music? Well, he pioneered, he, he pioneered a lot of studio techniques. He pushed overdubbing, the use of effects, editing. Um, so I'll tell you a story of how I think he's... he's um, his influence often worked. Um, he was one of the first guys to have a wah wah pedal. So he's using this wah wah pedal in his studio, mid 60s. And uh, Jimi Hendrix goes over to see him. And Jimi Hendrix goes, Oh, what, what's that? And he goes to the wah wah pedal and, and see what Frank's doing. He goes back to his studio and he um, records. <laughs> that he gets back and it's burning the midnight lamp. Um, and um, that's one of the great uses of the wah wah pedal. Um, so it shows you how, a f how, how important, the, important the studio was and using effects was, the, the, the way you could edit music. And of course, Zappa was ahead of everybody in this, you know. He is one of the great guitar heroes of all time, and he, he really puts the guitar at the center of what he does. And the way he plays, he's so drippy with the blues. But he's a guitarist that doesn't just play the blues, he's using a lot of strange scales, you know. So that's an influence. He brings classical influences into rock music. He, he's, he, he's almost like the very first prog metal musician and his influence on bands like Dream Theatre is immense, you know, because of that influence. He's a, his influence on prog is immense. His, his, his influence on virtuoso music you know, on what a band can actually physically do is, is immense. He's bringing forth the musicians that went on to do all these incredible things. You know, so many players from Adrian Ballou to Terry Bowes to Vinnie Collier to, to George Duke, you know, through um, Steve Vai, Mike Keneally, you know, so many musicians that went on to, to do their own thing came through his band. He, um, he changed the way business worked. He set up his own label and he made that work. I could just go on and on and on about the huge influence that Frank had. But I think the real thing was that he was a maverick and he was set up in opposition to the rest of the whole thing. You know, I felt when he died, not having that voice anymore, it, you, you didn't have Frank to turn to, to see him puncture whatever it is that had got too pompous within society. Can you imagine what would have happened if Zappa had been around when Trump got in power you know and, and I miss that 
fundamentally that's the thing I miss about Frank is that sneer and the humour the humour was so important in the end you know even though it may have diminished him in, in, in the critics' minds, it was so important to what he did and it just would not have worked. It would have been so, so pompous and pretentious. And I'll finish with a story that George Duke, the late great look George Duke said about Frank. He said when he joined the band, he'd come through sort of modern jazz musician and he was um, uh, playing like Coltrane, really playing out and really going nuts. And when he joined Frank's band, he was a little bit troubled about singing comedy songs and dressing up and acting out stuff on stage. And he, he, I think he sort of said this to Frank. And Frank turned around and he said, he, went, he said, people like Miles and Coltrane, he goes, that's really heavy. That's a really heavy way of playing music. He says, but there's other ways of being heavy too. And I think that's the key to Frank. He showed us other ways of being heavy. So um, if you like these videos, obviously this is, uh, <laughs> this will, um, it's probably one of the longest videos I've ever done. Um, if you like this video, you know, please like and subscribe, follow what I'm doing. I'm going to in the future get more in depth going into certain aspects of Zappa's career, looking at the musicians that went through. So if you like all this, you know, like and subscribe. But most importantly, put your comments in. You know, I'm sure I've got little bits wrong and dates wrong. You know, I, I do just do these videos off the top of my head. You know, it's like, oh, let's go and talk about Frank today. Uh, and I don't know where I'm going to go or what I'm going to say. And, and I think that's the, the thing I want to do. You know, I could do this tomorrow and probably say a whole bunch of different other things. And, you know, but if I did miss something or you've, you've got something to say about Frank that you think needs to be said, please put it in the comments. I've learned so much from people who watch this channel about the music I'm um, looking at. So please do that. And again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you soon. Bye.